you can't mention simulation theory without mentioning the Matrix movies. People were going crazy over it. The Matrix was real. We are living in a simulation. We are being inhabited by some sort of player. It's a game. A world without rules and control. What's the point of all this? Everyone is fake. I am not a body at all. I am the code. I am a string of numbers constantly replicating its cell vibration. None of this is real. I'm going to show these people what you don't want them to see. Well, um, Jonathan, first of all, congratulations on the on the score for the documentary, the horror documentary. We're going to talk about it a little bit later. The horror documentary, uh, Glitch in the Matrix. So I, you know, and and uh, the first thing I tell you when I was doing my 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 schedule for the Sundance Film Festival, and I read the description, I like, I, I'm watching this. I don't care. I'm watching it. <laughs> I don't, I don't even need to read the description. Just by the title itself, yeah, I'm right. watching it. So don't even, you, no, you need, nobody needs to explain to me what, what, what this is about. So I want to congratulate you on, on, the, on the score. Uh, I, obviously, I remember I watched the movie and I was blown away by it and, and by the score. And obviously, let me, I'm going to thank you for your time and for the space. I know we're all really busy. I'm really busy covering Sundance. I, hope, I know we're really busy with, with interviews and everything. So first of all, you know, congratulations and thank you for the space. Space. Oh, thank you for having me. It's my pleasure. No problem. Um, we should be short. I like short interviews, but um, uh, the first thing, you know, the first thing that I want to ask is obviously after finish watching the documentary, or, you know, what was your first thought when you, that they brought you, you know, they, they, they pitched you the idea of writing the score for this horror, and I keep saying horror because we're, we're going to talk about, it, you know, next, that this yeah. horror documentary uh, that yeah. I mentioned uh, in the Matrix. Um, well, you know, Rodney and I, who, who made the film, and I have been working together for a long time, and we're, as he puts it, we're kind of married now, right? So, like, I just sort of assume that I'm working on whatever he's working on, and I think vice versa. So, I mean, I knew about this movie long before it was even greenlit, if we knew we were actually going to get to make it, right? Because he always has a lot of sort of projects going, and some of them go, and some of them don't, you know? Um, and so, I mean, like you said, I heard the title and I knew what the music sounded like, <laughs> right? You know, like I have a deep, uh, guilty love uh, for those for those like '90s electronica hacker techno like compilation soundtrack albums, right? Like like The Matrix, um, Go, Hackers, Pi, Spawn, Blade, Blade Two, you know, like that kind of particular like sort of big soundtrack movie with a bunch of like you know 90s big beat electronic uh, electronica uh, like tracks on them like people like chemical brothers and crystal method and um uh, fat boy slim and then you know like the 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 sort of the weirder idm side of it too like apex twin and autiker and music and square pusher and all those people like i love all of that stuff and so just hearing the title glitch in the matrix knowing that it had to do with the the film the matrix uh like immediately speaks to a kind of music to me uh as it turns out filling a documentary with really aggressive like big beat techno uh is maybe not the best move um, so i had to sort of scale back a little bit use some of those sounds and techniques and kind of kind of bring them into this this century, uh, you know, this decade, and make them a little more my own, um, rather than just making like a, you know, what I wanted to do is just make uh -huh. a whole story that sounds like a Chemical Brothers or something, but I didn't get to quite, quite do that. Um, that's yeah. that's about it. That's pro that's probably what I thought yeah, of. I think you already jumped into one of my questions, and that's yeah. the, uh, I, I, um, there's so many scenes going around in this documentary. I know people are love it when they see it. And I know they're going to be blown away. I was blown away, so I know people are going to be blown away. At least my audience is going to be blown away because it's just down the alley of my audience. So, great, um, yeah. but, you know, there's so many things going on in this documentary. They're, they're, we're touching so many, so many topics, just not just the Matrix. We're talking about movies. We're talking about video games. We're talking about everything, basically, that revolves around technology and, and, and how we see the world, which I thought, you know, I, I felt was so interesting about everything. How did you prepare yourself? How did you, you know, how did you sit down? Because to me, this is a really complex score. 
even though it, it sounded really fun, and I, I'm pretty sure you had a lot of fun doing this. Uh, but it, to me, it's, it, it seems like a really complex score when you were, when you had so many pictures, you know, so many uh, things that were running around. How did you, you sit down, how did you sit down and you, how did you prepare yourself to, to you know, to score this documentary with all the different pieces coming around and the different subjects that, that you know, what, what was your inspiration when you had everything that you, you scored? Sure. Well, I, you know, like I, I come from a mostly electronic music background and though I write, I write, you know, real music for instruments too, but, um, but I knew just sort of the way that this movie felt and wanted to feel, you wanted to feel like the music was made by either a computer itself or at least a person oh. by themselves in a room full of computers and electronics. And fortunately, I happen to have a room full of computers and synthesizers uh, in which I make music. So was, that was a very sort of easy role for me to step into as the sort of, I remember when I was, you know, I keep talking about the score, the soundtrack to Pi, which I, I think doing this movie made me realize how influential that has been in, to my life. Mm -hmm. uh, and I remember reading an interview with Darren Aronofsky at the time in the 90s when Pi, when Pi came out about the music and talking about working with Clint Mansell on it and going over to Clint Mansell's garage filled with like half broken synthesizers and it being this kind of, you know, this kind of magical weird little dungeon that generated this sort of, the, the, the generated this music. And I remember, you know, as a teenager reading that and thinking that sounds like a cool job to have, <laughs> is to have a garage full of, full of electronics that make music somehow. And the same thing, I remember reading an interview with James Cameron where he talks about the experience of going over to Brad Fidel's house during the Terminator, which was just a garage filled with these synthesizers. And it just like, I mean, in hindsight, you have a very clear trajectory of your life, but reading this stuff, you know, as being a lover of movies and then a lover of music and electronic music specifically, it feels like, it feels like I was like, guided to this point very, very clearly by my loves and my interests. So, you know, I mean, there's a, there's a great tradition in, in music in general, but especially in like technological music, mm -hmm. right? Of like um, sounds that come from the equipment malfunctioning or not, you know, or not being used properly, like even a distorted guitar, right? Like the sort of first versions of a distorted guitar were because like the, the speaker cones in the amplifiers would get torn mm -hmm. and people wouldn't know how to fix them and they'd just play the distorted guitar and they'd make it sound really beautiful and then people started making pedals to emulate that tone and mm -hmm. all this equipment to emulate that tone and, and 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 the same thing of course happens in electronic music you know um you have all these artists like um you know who are who are like sort of on this sort of bleeding edge of of glitch like Rayo Giacchita or uh Tim and Florian Hecker uh, and like Adam Hart and uh, Alba Noto, uh, Pansonic, hugely influential for me. Um, and um, uh, like Mika Venio, who was in Pansonic, who passed away not too long ago. Um, but like all, all of the, you know, there's this big tradition of like saying like, oh, you're not supposed to like clip your audio or you're not supposed to have these like weird DC offset pops in your audio. Let's just make a song that only does that. Like just take those and make a piece out of that and see if that's interesting. Or like, let's make a piece with microphone feedback or no mix, no input mixer feedback like Toshimura Nakamura or somebody. Um, and so I tried to think about like, well, what is today's version of that? Because all those people have done this, right? And um, and what is a what 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 are what are our versions right now of these glitches? And because the movie uh, takes place so much in these interviews that were recorded over Skype and Zoom and in these imperfect means, um, they are full of these sort of new, relatively new audio glitches that we are still trained to think are like ugly and unwanted, like the way that audio is compressed so that it can pass over the internet is still really like awful sounding to me. Um, and, and so I thought, well, maybe, maybe it's, it's worth just leaning into this sound that I actually don't like and finding what's beautiful inside of that and trying to make music out of that. So I did a lot of like, you know, I would just like set up two computers in my house and like have a zoom meeting, making like infinite feedback sound between them until it got really distorted. And then I would sample that and like sort of use that in a track or like, you know, I would like, I made a little script on my computer to just sort of recursively uh, convert cues into worse and worse sounding MP3s, you know, until they would kind of get destroyed, sort of an Alvin Lucier kind of like I am sitting in a room process, but inside a computer. Mm -hmm. um, 
And then I used a lot of tools that are designed to emulate bad streaming audio. There are a lot of plugins, mostly for mastering engineers. So you can like click on a button and say like, oh, I wanna hear how my song sounds on Spotify or on YouTube or on Tidal or whatever, you know? Um, and uh, and so I used some of those and this particular plugin called um, Lossy by this company called Good Hertz that is a more musical approach to dealing with like, um, like mp3 and like lossy audio compression mm -hmm. that i i spent so much time with that plugin i think maybe i'm not allowed to use it ever again in my life i think it's it's on like every i'm i'm sure i am the first person to take because i also did the sound design and mixed the film and i'm sure i'm the first person to take an entire film mix and run every channel like through that plugin so that the whole film mix can like have a giant streaming buffer error meltdown at mm -hmm. times which hearing those compression artifacts in like glorious like 5.1 surround sound just like and hearing the whole mix kind of like strangle itself like that I, mm -hmm. I think it's really beautiful I think it yeah. really is. I definitely had a turnaround about those sounds I've learned to love watery garbagey compressed audio in that way um which I did not before this film well you know I think one of this there, there are many things that are stand out from the movie. I think the score one of them. I, another thing that stood out to me was the interviews and a uh, little bit of spoiler, uh, the, the avatars that they, that yeah. the director used for, for you know, <laughs> to protect the identities and everything. I wanted to ask you, did you know ahead of time that he was going to do that? And yeah, okay, so, so how did you, you know, did that play a role in, in scoring, you know, those type of scenes? No, I, I, I don't know how much of a role it played in the music that was definitely the idea from the beginning okay. you know and when I started working on it um I was mostly looking at the interviews without those animated uh characters right because because that takes some time yeah. I'm, I'm I haven't actually worked on a lot of animation so I sort of understand conceptually that oh you're mostly working with like wireframes and sketches and things until the the movie gradually starts to take shape but I really didn't I mean I didn't really understand the impact of replacing those characters with the animated figures until they were all in. And then I sort of, and then there was like a switch flipped and I was like, oh, I understand this movie in a way that I didn't before. And now I need to change a bunch of music and change a bunch of sound and do a bunch of new stuff to it, you know? Um, but yeah, that was in the, that was in the cards from the beginning. And that provided a really interesting like sound design problem too, is like, what do those characters sound like, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. um, because like there's some sound in the room that was just captured by their computer mics on Skype or Zoom or whatever. Um, but, but there are also then all these new elements that we're adding to their bodies and their costumes. And do those make sound? And what sort of sounds should they make? And so I found myself, I mean, we, this, this movie had an extraordinary amount of Foley work in it for a documentary. Like usually there's not a lot of Foley work in a talking head documentary, but we were just watching it. I was like, you know, I think we need to hear uh, this spacesuit move around as this character talks. We need to hear all the stuff in their world. We made the decision that it shouldn't sound in any way like futuristic or mm -hmm. science fiction-y, right? That it should sound very, very natural. Um, and I ended up, there was like, there were like a few passes of Foley. The Foley artist, Joan Rowe, who did all of the Foley for this is kind of a legend. Her credit list is incredible. She worked on like RoboCop 2 and Speed and like all these incredible movies. Like her, she's been doing this forever. So we were really lucky to have someone so incredible do the Foley for this. Uh, and then like one of the very last things that we did is we were looking at it because I had made the decision that the full, like the Foley in those rooms, we only hear, um, the very practical sounds of banality, mm -hmm. right? That like, I was like, I don't wanna hear ventilators. I don't wanna mm -hmm. hear like robot, like motor noises as this robot is moving around. But I do wanna hear the creaky chair and the cloth of the costume and all of this stuff, like just to make it feel really mm -hmm. real and, and it sort makes of- sense. It makes sense, human. yeah. But by the very end, we, saw, we thought, you know, I think we kind of need to hear a little bit of the robot noises and mm -hmm. a little bit of the ventilator and stuff. And so I did like a couple of scenes and we said, yeah, shoot, we got to go back and do the whole, all of the characters all again. So I did, I shot all that my fully myself in, in this room. I had like a little coffee tin that I was using as a ventilator that I was like breathing with. And um, 
one of the robot one of the robot characters his like foley movement is actually there's a layer in it that i'm using these induction microphones that pick up like radio interference not sound like like electrical vibrations not um audio vibrations and i had this have this giant modular synthesizer here ah, that's nice that I, had, that I had turned on but nothing plugged into it and i was just moving these induction microphones around it doing fully for this character it's like the most expensive <laughs> and underused modular synthesizer in any in any context so funny. that's awesome that's whatever so works awesome. you know yeah, I, I gotta tell the people that are listening on the podcast to go and watch the video because they will not understand what yeah. what they what they just explain and why I'm laughing because because that's really interesting that that type of answer that so uh, that's cool that's really cool so um I didn't I know you want to add anything else but I was gonna jump on on the other question that you know yeah, please the the horror side of the documentary that I was laughing about it because I understand you know there I don't want to that I mean to spoilers I obviously this 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 interview was recorded before so it's gonna be released on for everyone but um um to me it's to me it felt more like a wake up call than like I hey mm. go out smell the roses and 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 live life and 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 understand what you're what you're doing and everything else more than a horror movie or, or a horror I, I understand when when how because the reason we 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 you know we sold it as a as a horror documentary because we're you know this is scary this is scary stuff that's going on in the world mm-hmm. and uh, with technology with gaming with everything but I to me it felt more like to me it felt more human more 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 of a more more of a more it had more sentiments more more, more. To me, it's a smart documentary when we're trying to get a point across to you. You know, I think the way you know, like, I don't want to enter too many spoilers, but you know, the way it ended to me, it felt like that. It, it, it had a human touch uh, uh, more than anything. Um, you know, what what do you expect people, you know, to get away from it when 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 they see it? Not not I mean with you if you find it, you just, once you see the final product of it, obviously. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I, to me, horror, like genre categories are sort of marketing terms, right? And, and, I, and I, I think we made sort of a legitimate horror documentary uh, in the film The Nightmare uh, before that we did, uh, which actually has a lot of horror tropes in it. There's like, it's a documentary with jump scares, you know, and things like that. Uh, and I think that movie is genuinely frightening. This movie maybe is less frightening, but I think, I think the horror, like, marketing label is almost like, I think this movie will appeal to people who love horror movies, Mm -hmm. you know, and I think the sensibilities, we all love horror movies and we all make horror movies who worked on it. And I think the sensibility is there and there's a shared language, even though, yeah, calling this a horror movie, I think is maybe not um, the most accurate, but I think, but I think that, I think that will help it find its audience, right? Mm -hmm. I think it's a very smart marketing category to attach to this movie. I mean, Rodney's really good in his documentaries too about like, I like, uh, it's it's flawed to pretend pretend a documentary is objective, right? Mm -hmm. Like like there's always like a subjective lens of the filmmaker that you're seeing all of these topics through. And Rodney definitely has uh, an opinion, you know, and the, the film has an opinion and that opinion is sometimes very uh, blatant, but I, but I love that in not sort of pretending to be objective, uh, this, this film can still be about people and about those mm-hmm. people's theories more than it can be more. It's not trying to be a survey of the idea mm-hmm. of simulation theory. It really is just about how these sort of very different experiences of simulation theory has affected some people's sort of lives. And there are the people who, there are central sort of like four characters who, who sort of, who do believe that we live in a simulation and how that they have, how do they have sort of the evidence that they found in their own lives about uh, that, that have proved to them that it's a simulation uh, and also the evidence. and, And then also how that has actually affected their lives and how that sort of, practically works out to a day-to-day like how do you behave if you live in a simulation um and i think those are really interesting and then there are these other sort of more academic uh interviews people who are not replaced with avatars who have interesting ideas and thoughts about simulation theory uh and in cases have written books and articles about it but um but don't necessarily 
their personal beliefs don't enter into it. Mm -hmm. You know, this is kind of, I mean, I don't know if you saw Rodney's first feature that I also scored, Room 237, which is about mm -hmm. um, uh, conspiracy theories that people have about Stanley Kubrick's movie, The Shining, mm -hmm. which... Um, Another amazing thing, by the way. Oh, yeah, thanks. Uh, yeah, I, 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 that was... I, that was I, it's everything, it's just that, that, the, the, like, like, the thing, like this movie, just the topic around everything just works, so... Well, but people, I, you know, I, I would occasionally read sort of disappointed reviews of Room 237 saying, well, I didn't learn anything about The Shining and I think all these theories are bullshit. And it's kind of like, yeah, but that's not what the movie's yeah, exactly. about, right? That's, like, <laughs> like the- You're not seeing it, you're, that's something that I can completely agree, yeah. Um, and, and Rodney's very good at doing something that I think people are sort of unused to. There aren't a lot of like documentary filmmakers who I think really nail this the way Rodney does. Um, which the film itself is the is the thing you're looking at, not the subject of the film, right? Which is sort of to which is to me like a maybe a semantic distinction. But like when you watch um, like Thin Blue Line or uh, Act of Killing or any of these documentaries that are that are so stylized, you mm -hmm. are really watching a film, and you're not just like getting a like the film is not pretending to be an objective crash course in its subject, mm -hmm. right? The film is 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 tell is is exploring this subject with narrative with like filmic narrative techniques. Yes, I'll see um, a conversation. It's, it's, it's yeah, a conversation. Um, in a way that I think a lot of documentaries um, don't try. A lot of documentaries sort of pretend to be objective, and of course mm -hmm. they can't be, and they're not. But um, but they have more of kind of like an info dump sort of quality to them and there's a place for that too i mean i'm not i'm not trying to say that like mm -hmm. you know other films are bad but i but i but i think but i but i do appreciate getting to work on rodney's films in this in this context because we can really play with form and it and it is so much you know it, it is it is so much a film like it needs to be a film it's not a, a survey on a topic that happens to take the form of a film mm -hmm. If that makes sense. I don't want to let you go without, you know, in, uh, you know, giving us a, big, a, a little teaser. Maybe you're, if you're working on something else. I know you worked with uh, David uh, Diggy in in, uh, in Seoul in the the, yeah. the movie that, uh, I, I I just I lost the, the name of the track, but I love Seoul. I mean, and I, I cried on Seoul, and who got, who didn't cry on Seoul? I don't know. <laughs> so I mean, I I don't want to let you go without you know maybe giving us a little bit of teaser if you're working in. Anything else that we can, we should be keep an eye on down the line. Aside, from obviously, uh, when the, this movie comes out for everybody else, on I think it's February five it's going to come out. On yeah. Um, well, uh, you know, I it's hard to talk about works in progress because you never know. Like there's always a lot of things going on, but um, but but things I can actually talk about. Well, what's funny, a movie that came out actually before this movie, uh, before Glitch in the Matrix, is another Rodney Asher film called The El Duce Tapes which is, I think, available on all sort of streaming platforms now, or at least on demand. Uh, and I have a soundtrack album for that coming out on Burning Witch, Burning Witches Records uh, out of UK, um, like next month. Um, and I'm really excited about that one. That was, that one's a really, yeah. that was like- You're making adult. music, you're making music. Like you yeah, say. yeah, yeah. So I have a soundtrack album coming out. My, my band Clipping with W Diggs, we just did yeah. uh, an evening length, like a, like a live stream concert uh, a couple of days ago that is around and available to watch. And we have a lot more stuff in the works coming out too. That's so it. yeah, there's always a lot going on. Um, and, uh, but the things right now are, are Glitch in the Matrix and this El Duce Tapes soundtrack album too, which I, which I hope people check out. Um, yeah. It's like my, it's a very different score from Glitch in the Matrix. It's well, my like- Do it, like, you can forward me the, the link. I'll put it on the description in, in, the, in the video so that people can, can look for it. And that's, uh, that's an easy way for it to people to reach it. So um, again, congratulations on the score, the awesome score in my book. Thank you so much. Thank blown you. Away. I was blown away by everything in the movie, but yeah. I knew the score also was really good. And was, oh, everything man. the movie was perfect. I don't know. To me, everything was perfect, and I got no complaints. I, just, yeah. I mean, from my end, the, once you see my review, no complaints from the from the movie. I, I love to complain. I think anybody gonna enjoy it, and and, the, and it's gonna one of the things that I that I did tell on my review is um, it's gonna cause a conversation, which is something that I always love about documentaries when they cast 
a conversation and, and yeah. it, it, sparked, it sparked a conversation. So I gotta congratulate you on that and, 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 and the score and you know, good luck on all your future projects, uh, Jonathan. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me.